get started, Poker Talk. Now we can get started. Shavua Tov, um, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. And Rabbi Lipta kick off the first of 10. So uh, Shirim this weekend, Vakashat, the, the number seven. And uh, we'll, I guess pretty soon we'll get to Hanukkah. Well, I, I know you mentioned already That's last week. Yeah. The number between That's seven and eight, Hanukkah. the connection eight over seven. But in the meantime, we're still at seven. I think today, Yaakov Avinu, you said seven and Yaakov Avinu in the temple. So Vakashat, Rabbi Liptak. Okay. Um, just before I begin, I hope you understand the title. What's the connection between Yaakov Avinu and the temple? Any connection might come to mind between Yaakov Avinu and the Beit HaMikdash? Or was anyone in Shul this week? Is there a yeah. He's the first person. He's the first person to come up with this idea of building a house for God. Avram built an altar and called out in God's name. But the idea of a bite for God, a house for God, that was his idea that uh, he came up with and it might have been his dream. Now, there's nothing, the number seven isn't there in that story, but what I want to focus on today is how God's name Elohim, even though we find Elohim with all the forefathers, it's especially prominent by, by Yaakov Avinu. I'm going to try and explain why and how that might explain why the number seven comes up so much in his life. So just give me some examples of the number seven in Yaakov's life that comes up a lot. Where's the classic? If you again, I'm I'm just all these things came to mind because of Shul this week. Oh, he yeah, has so the seven seven years for his wives and the yeah that kind of stuff. And there's a source for seven brachas this week, wasn't there? Yeah, I'll try to explain why it's not shot, but there's seven and by Shavuot, whatever that means. It's really a complicated pasuk. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the number seven comes up very central in relation to not just marriage but having children. <coughs> Let's see. Now, just in general, it's going to make sure people have been following. What does the number seven have to do with having children? Just in general. And, and God's name, Elohim. Great Mila. No, that was last week's share, how we go from seven to eight. But the, I'm, se I'm not... the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah, Nifkida, Sarah, Nifkida. That, that, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in simple, simple shot. Remember the first, remember the seventh day of creation, God's name is Elohim? Mm -hmm. sure. The first seven days of creation is the screaming God's name Elohim, who made all the powers of nature. And in that section, not only Adama Rishon is blessed with Purvu, even the fish and the fowl. Remember, all living things are blessed with Purvu. Vegetation is blessed, not with Purvu, but Esa Mazriya Zera. It's blessed with the ability to reproduce. And the idea of nature and the ability of reproduction goes hand in hand with nature. It's a blessing that God made living things with the ability to reproduce themselves. We have to recognize that God gave us that ability and it's not a separate God or a separate power that does it. But don't be surprised that we're going to find the number seven in relation to something that has to do with having children. Now, last week, we took that idea a step farther, pun intended. We went from seven to eight. And so why Brit Mila, which has a lot to do with having children, also relates to that. So what I want to do today is show the different things that we have, the number seven. Um, and, um, and we're going to and, and find out. But for, in that chat, I'll just mention what Sarah wrote when she read this week's Parsha. It didn't take Leah seven years to have a child. It took seven years until she, until she got married. Was, Yaakov worked for seven years without a wife. And after seven years of work, he asked for his wife. But but she didn't have the child until after he married Rachel. No, no. She had children right away. I know. I thought when I was reading it, it seemed like she had a child only after he married Rachel. That after he married no, Rachel, no, no, then it said no. she had Ruvain. No, Ruvain had right away. As soon as she got married, she had with I think within a year. It seems like it seems like she has six children within, and she takes a break in the middle after four. But you know. There's a problem with all the years, but in general, she has children. As soon as she's married, they have children right away. How about if I may, since okay, no, but I'm I'm assuming uh, the, the simple shot in the Chumash is she married Rachel right away. She just he had to work another seven years. In other words, he married That's Leah. Right. No, no, no. A week Rachel later, he married Rachel. Years. They were married right away. It was a week later, and then he had to because he there was first he worked seven years, but then he got two wives, and then he worked another seven years. Yeah, but isn't that they, the shot in the Chumash? Yeah, yeah, she had. He married both of them within a week's time or so, or within, within the year for sure. That's the machloket between Rashi and Ramban.
but you, but she had a, um, but once he got married to both of them that year, Leah had children right away, and Rachel was Akara, was, um, didn't have children for seven years. Because only after those seven years are over, after Rachel is a child, then Yaakov says it's time to go home. Now, it just so happens that after his time was up for ma making, making the payment, but that's, we'll get to that maybe a little bit later on. So let's get to work. What I need to do, then I have to share my source sheet today. And because what we did last week was a bit complicated, I want to begin today with a quick review. I wrote my intro, make sure I remember it. So last week, we traced the concept of covenant as it began to say for Brashit, remember? And we showed how that covenant, there's a covenant with God's name, Yud Kevavke, that was Ben Abtarim. But there's a covenant with God's name, Elohim, that began with God's creation of all living things that was solidified in the recreation story with the flood. And remember, there was, we talked about last week, there were two reasons for the flood. We focused on the reason for the flood, B'Shem Elohim. And God's decision after the flood not to bring another flood, B'Shem Elohim, which was called the Rainbow Covenant. And immediately, in preparation of that Rainbow Covenant, God gives what we call the seven Noahide laws. And, uh, and those begin with, that we saw last week, where he says, Pluravu, and ends with Pluravu. Um, and therefore, Pluravu and Shem Elohim go hand in hand. So we saw last week how, the, um, how that progression of covenant, uh, we, went to, we went from Brit Milah to Brit, from, sorry, Brit Milah, that's, that's a typo there, from Brit Keshe to Brit Milah to Brit Sinai. Sorry about that. We got to fix that. That should be Keshe. I'll erase that later. That should be Brit Keshe to Brit Milah to Brit Sinai. And this week, we're going to continue that study and suggest the reason why the number seven appears so many times in Yaakov's life and also in relation to the Mishkan. Okay, now, um, so I want to do just a quick review to make sure it's clear about why I'm building so much on this, on this parallel, because my whole point is that Chumash is doing this intentionally. It's not, oh, by chance it comes out that way. But Chumash is intentionally building up a theme where I go from creation to recreation where in the recreation story of the flood, God promises not to bring another flood because now we're moving to a world of tshuva, of fixing things. And in light of that, God has to pick a nation that will be its model nation to be the example of a nation that can do tshuva. But we did the parallel, and we showed the obvious parallels between Brit Keshet in chapter 9, which began with Atem Puravul Shutsuba Aretz. And Elohim told Noach, um, and Noach in all, creating, in all things created, He's going to establish his Brit with them, by Kimoti Briti. And the old Brit was the, the rainbow. And I mentioned the rainbow as seven. I'm not sure how critical that is, but it's just interesting that, this, that the rainbow is one of the few phenomena in nature that you have seven in a natural phenomena. If there indeed there are seven used to the rainbow, which I think there are. This, that's how we perceive it. Now, um, in Brit Mila, we have the same basic keywords. We have God's name Elohim making a Brit. We have the phrase Vakimot Yod Briti. We have the phrases Beni Obein. We have God's name Elohim and an Od Brit, that being circumcision. And that's last week we focused on that might be the reason why circumcision is one above seven or eight. And we talked about the Brit, that Vakimot Yod Briti, these two Britot, where God says, I'm not going to bring another flood, but therefore, what does he do if society or civilization goes bad? So God forever has a Brit Olam, an eternal Brit, with a nation that should be his model nation and their destiny and their goal is to be a model nation other nations can learn from. And hopefully um, that can help fix things when things go bad. Will it work? That's up to the Jewish people, but that's an eternal destiny that they're charged with. And then we talked about how we have the exact same phrases by Brit Sinai. We have Pru rule by Brit Sinai, and uh, we had all those phrases, and then we needed the old Brit, and that was Shabbat. So that's a review of what we did last week. I wanted to get that idea across to make sure it was clear before we continued. And I want to return to something we didn't focus on last week. It's God's name, El Shaddai. I don't think we talked about that last week, if I'm not mistaken. Or did we? No, so two times. I want to explain something, which has a lot to do with Yaakov's name. El Shaddai is a special name in Sefer Breshit. It's pretty much unique to Sefer Breshit. And our forefathers mentioned the name, usually in relation to having children, but God himself speaks with the name El Shaddai only two times. In chapter 17 is the first time he introduces himself as El Shaddai. Pay attention to what he says. He tells Avram, I'm El Shaddai. He commands him, we connected that to the 
Noach and the flood. And then the first thing he does, he changes Avram's name to Avraham and then makes Brit Mila. The next time El Shaddai is going to speak is in the story where God changes Yaakov's name officially to Yisrael. That's going to be in this week's Parsha coming up. I picked this topic for this week because it ties together by and by Yishlach together. Which means there's a Bechira process, there's a filtering process of God picking our forefathers. And even though logic would dictate that if God's going to pick Avram Avinu, all of his children should be chosen and they sh- and that should become the Jewish people. That's what Avram thought. And that's the simple shot what God told him. For some reason, only one of Avram's children is chosen, only Sarah's child Yitzchak. And the most complicated story, which we had a week before, was that even though Yitzchak has two children from the same wife, only one is chosen. But that decision, only one being chosen, we'll see how El Shaddai is going to be involved in that, in that decision. But the final, the, the conclusion of that, of that filtering process, which we call Bechira, being chosen, we'll reach that critical point where we, we have our three generations where only one forefather is chosen, and they become the patriarchs. Afterwards, all the children are chosen, no matter who the wife is, no matter how good or bad they are. That's going to be the critical point of Yaakov's name change to Israel, which will be this week's Parsha. So we're going to see soon, that's the next time El Shaddai is going to speak. So keep that in mind, that El Shaddai is a special name in the Bechira process, beginning with the name change of Avram to Abraham, and ending with the name change of Yaakov to, to Yisrael. Now, I want to use that to try to understand what's going on in Yaakov's life. So let's begin now our new topic. Okay. I call the centrality of Shem Elokim in the life of Yaakov. And then we'll talk about centrality of number seven in relating to marriage. My assumption is, at least, and a lot of Parshim explain this, I know it's a big argument, that Yitzchak had no reason to think that both his children are not chosen. Remember, God told him, in fact, let's open up a Chumash real fast. If I take a look in a, um, actually, you probably remember by heart. There's a famine in the land, and God tells uh, Yitzchak, don't go down to uh, Egypt, stay in the land. Gurbar says, I'll be with you. You and your offspring are getting this land. And, and you're going to get the shvua that I made with Avram Avinu, with Avram, your father. Therefore, Yitzchak has no reason to think that both his children are not chosen. Rivka, of course, knows differently. They know that's all topic in, uh, we discussed back in Parsha Todot, if you're aware of that, you're not in this series, but, but earlier on. And only after the mixed up brachot, where Yitzchak was hoping that both children, was assuming that both of his children were chosen and wanted to give leadership and I guess political leadership and military leadership to Esav. And then he would give the, I guess, religious leadership or educational leadership to Yaakov, pretty much like what happens later between Yudan and Levi or something like that. He wanted to split the family and in, in basically have Esav take care of the political side, what's called the Gashmis, and take and let Yaakov take care of the Ruchnias. That was his Habamina. That's what he was hoping would be. That's what he was assuming was being. And for some reason, God wants Rivka to know it's going to go another generation, but he doesn't know that. Why that happens, why that drama, a topic for another share. My assumption is that after the mixed up brachot, Yitzchak and Rivka had a discussion, which they do. In that discussion, Rivka must have told Yitzchak what's going on, and Yitzchak realizes that it's going to be one more generation. That explains why at that point, once Yitzchak realizes it's going to be one more generation, after he talks to Rivka, he sends Yaakov off to get a wife and listen to the blessing, the final blessing that Yitzchak gives Yaakov. Yitzchak calls Yaakov and blesses him. Now it's time to get married and you have to marry within the family of Terach like he did and you can't take from the daughters of Khan like Esau did. Go back to Padan Aram where Terach's family is. Take from Lavan's daughters. I guess they know already. They had communicated about the family. Now he's going to give him a blessing, the gotcha blessing. But of all names, what does he pick? The El Shaddai He's hoping now that El Shaddai, who changed Avram's name to Abraham, and when he changed Avram's name to Abraham, he told Abraham in the exact same setting that right after Rit Mila, that Sarah will have a child. And her child will be chosen. And even though Yishmael is blessed, he won't be the chosen one. 
and he'll uh, he'll be a wonderful person, have a great nation. But the Britia Kimetitzchak. So in the same setting of Milan, chapter seventeen in Breshit, God tells Avram Avinu not just the name change, but also that Sarah is going to have a child, and that his name will be Yitzchak, and that's why Yitzchak doesn't need a name change because God gave him his name in the framework when God told when when God changed Avram's name to Abraham. And because that's the name that God used in choosing Abraham and Sarah and Yitzhak in that same setting in chapter 17, all in the framework of Shem Elohim, now it's time for Yaakov to get married. Yitzhak blesses them that El Shaddai, who chose Avram um, and Yitzhak for exclusion of Ishmael, that he should bless him. Again, plural. All the same phrases we had in Brit Milah. Which is exactly Brit Milah, the Chala Zaracha, the Rishchet Eretz Bogoracha. That's exactly the phrase we have. in, I'll show this phrases again above in Brit Milah. Asher Natan Elohim Lavraham. If I go back to Brit Milah that we had before, just a quick review. Remember, he changes the name. Vifreitu Chavimod Maod. That's the plural. Vakimot Yet Briti. Liot Lachal Elohim. That same phrase. And I'm going to give you the Zaracha Eretz Bogoracha. The same phrase. Eretz Kanan. Eretz Bogoracha. Eretz Kanan. And then the old priest will be circumcision. And God's name again is Elohim. In the continuation, he tells Sarah that um, he tells Abram that Sarah is going to have a child, and the priest will be with that child named Yitzchak. So that makes sense now. Why once Yitzchak realizes that, he gives this blessing that God should bless God's name in the in the from the perspective of El Shaddai should bless them, watch over him, and give him children. Because El Shaddai goes hand in hand with Brit Milan Shem Elohim. Don't be surprised that in the wedding process and giving having children and getting married, we're going to find the number seven. That's all I wanted to explain. You know, why Dafka, there's seven years. And that's where what happens when it's time to get married, Yaakov loves Rachel, and he says, What number does he come up with? Seven years later, what's Lavan say? Um, remember when Yaakov complains, what'd you do to me? He says, I can't give the older before the younger. Remember the trickery gets he gets paid back for the trickery, all the midah can I get midah. No in Yaakov's life. But then he tells him as follows: Malay Shavuazot. This is a really difficult pasuk. What does what does Yaakov? Um, I'm sorry, Yaakov complains to Lavan. What deal does Lavan make with Yaakov if he wants really wants Rachel? Malay Shavuazot, fulfill what? So they translate here the week. Which was a lot of Parshim say that. The problem is, there's no concept of a week before the story of the month. And there's no logical reason there would be a week. The, the idea of a seven day week only makes sense once we have the story of the month. Unless you have the story of creation. But again, in, in Shat, the story of creation, Amisol receives at Har Sinai. I know in the Midrash, they have kept all the mitzvot, they kept Shabbat. But at, at the Pshat level, there's no logic that anyone is keeping Shabbat. And even if Amisol is, the family of Lavan for sure isn't. Nowhere in Mesopotamia is there a seven-day week. And nowhere is it called a Shavua. And nowhere else in Chumash is it mentioned until the month's story. Therefore, the idea of a week, of people keeping a week, is unheard of. And therefore, a lot of Parshim say the Shavua means an either, either possibly the oath of working another seven years. It might be referring to that. It's just written Chaser. Or it might be referring to and but remember a Shavua, um, here's it's the it's the feminine. Um, and like Shavua, like she, even though it's Shavua, but in grammar it's, it's masculine. Remember Shiva Shavua, not, not Sheva. Remember Shiva Shavua Tisporlach. And therefore, Zod can't be referring to the week, it's got to be referring, some parts can say the week of Leah and then have a week for Rachel. But other parts can say it's referring to the seven years again, you know, fulfill. And that's what Ramban goes in that direction and says, Yaakov asked for his wife at the beginning of the seventh years. The seven years weren't over yet, but they were almost over. He says, oh, we're so close already. Give me my wife now. And then, um, and then he says, oh, we'll finish off those seven years. There's another couple of months left. Finish those off. And then you can work another seven years for Rachel. You can, that's, I don't want to get into Machok in Russian Ramban. I'm just saying the word Shavuot here is very difficult to say. Mshad really means a week. Because there's no concept of the week that existed before him. But Menachem, why, why can't yeah. it just be seven days? Like, 
that's a you know wedding a wedding celebration is seven days not a week just seven days it could be that was a minute but then that's but why write first of all the word shavu is not in the rest of chumash it's not written this way shavu we have a vav in it don't we Right, so it's Sheva. That's what, well, the word is Sheva, not Shavuah. We assume the Sheva, in fact, we learned Sheva Brachot from here. Almost all the Parshim talk about that, that this is like the source for Sheva Brachot. It's definitely not Pshat, though. Again, if you want to see the, there's a giant argument between Ramban and Rashi. All the Parshim talk about it, they're bothered by it, but it's hard to say that it was like, a, it, was, it could have been a Minnick for seven days, but why call it a week? Nothing, we never have any, there's no concept of a Shavu beforehand, and nowhere else in Tanakh do you have that until again, until you get to Sefer Vayikra or Shmot with Aman and Sefer Vayikra with, um, you know, with the laws of, of Shavuot and stuff, and then Sefer is learned for sure. Why? So, why isn't this just a mistranslation? It says Shavuah, they translate it as weak, but it's really, it, the word is Sheva. And it can mean seven days. Why? So forget the week. Just call it seven days and translate it that way. Well, they sheva zot, but yeah. Is like sheva zot, but these what? No. Sheva means zot, zot is the woman. The, the, woman. the shavua, the sheva, the, but they the seven days for Leah. Yeah, zot, this one. He, he doesn't call his daughters by name. He just calls them this one. Zot. Zot. This one. And that's why Benidah um, Hagamet Zot. That's, that's how the Septuagint translates it. This one's for Leah, and that's for, for Rachel. All, all I'm saying is, the word Sheva here, most likely this means seven, like you're saying. I'm just saying, in the context of Yaakov getting married and having children, we find seven years and maybe seven days. That's all. <coughs> What's important to me, the number seven centers around Yaakov having children. That's all. I don't, it's not, not making a big deal about it. I'm just making it, mentioning it inside, as, as an aside. Um, now, I mentioned before Yaakov's name change. So <clears throat> when Yaakov comes back after all his travails and finally, you know, passes a sub, wins that fight, God appears to him one last time um, at, in the beginning of Parakal Menhe, in the middle of Parakal Menhe, that Elohim, notice that Elohim appears to Yaakov when he came back from Padan Aram. Remember, on his way to Padan Aram, that's why I want to make a big deal about this. Yep. Um, Yitzchak tells his father and tells him, Kulech Paden Aram, you go to Paden Aram to get married. Because it's also called Haran. But Yaakov is sent by, ya- by Yitzchak to Paden Aram to get married. He's sent by Rachel, he's sent by Rivka's mother to Haran to save his life. But now, in the framework of Paden Aram, when he comes back from Paden Aram, on the way there, he blessed the El Shaddai Verechotcha, Beitet the Kalamim, Pruvu, and give you Birkat Avraham. Look what happens now at the end of the unit in Paraklam and Hay. What does it say here? God appeared to Yaakov one more time when he came back from Padana Ram and he blessed him. And what does Elohim tell him? Notice God's name here, Elohim. He changed his name from Yaakov to Yisrael. Yisrael. Elohim, Ani El Shaddai. The same thing he told Avram of you. Remember back up here, Ani El Shaddai, with the name changed to Abraham. Let's show you one last time. Ani El Shaddai. The only two times we have that phrase, God speaking El Shaddai, with the two name changes. And then what does he say? All the same words that we had with pray or vey, like Brit Mila, the exact same things he told um, we had before him with Avram Avinu. And Brit Mila, remember? Word for word, the promise of Brit Milah. And therefore, All I'm trying to point out is God's name Elohim is very um, central in Yaakov's life. And therefore, in his nether, remember when he wants to build a Beit HaMikdash, When yet, when Yaakov refers to God and wants to build a house for God, God's name there is Elohim. And it relates to the number seven in the God of creation. And basically the more universal concept of God and making a name for God, because we'll see that's going to be the purpose of the bite for God that he wants to build. Then Yaakov puts the Matzeba in the same place. And he, remember, he comes back to the same place where he had his dream. He can't build the temple yet because it's not time yet. His family's not settled down yet. In fact, he has trouble with his family. So he repeats his, his resolution when he calls the place... Um, 
by Shem Mamakom Asher Diber Itol Shem Elim Betel, he's not making a prediction that one day a temple will be there. He's stating like he did before his resolution that he wishes one day he can build a house for God there. But you can't build a house for God until people look up to you. And Yaakov was hoping when he was running away on his way to Lavan, on his way to Padan Aram, he was hoping that when he would come back and God would be with him and he'd get back Esav and Esav would get over it, he'd come back with the family, he'd come back and establish himself in the land of Israel and that maybe that would be Ben of Tarim. It was, the exile would be over, he'd come back, he'd be able to set up a family and make a name for God and build a house for God. That was his great dream and hope, but it didn't happen. What went wrong, you can argue they did the right thing and wrong thing, but after Shimon and Levi did what they did in Shem and they built the city and massacred it, you're not going to go make a name for God and build a house for God. Beitel instead becomes a place of refuge for the, um, for the family. And instead of Beitel being a place to make God's name known, like it was for Abraham Vino, it becomes a place where God has to save Yaakov from, from, uh, from the local population. And then several years later, Yosef is sold. And Yaakov's great dream to build a house for God is never fulfilled. It's a big tragedy that he has. He was hoping to do that. And it's not fulfilled until... Until um, until David Melach. If I'll show you later on, that's why. Um, actually, let me just show you right now in case I forget. I want to show you how when Yaakov made his neder. Um, right here, where he got his name changed from Yaakov to Israel, and God makes that promise. Yaakov is still hoping that he can still build that house for God. He's not ready yet, but he's hoping it'll happen. He just needs time for things to settle down, become wealthy, and the other people in the, in the area to look up to him. Yaakov can't do it because, again, what happened with Shimon and Levi, what happens with Yosef and his brothers? He goes down to Egypt. He can't build a house for God in Egypt. We're in Egypt for hundreds of years. We come out of Egypt. We get the land of Israel in the time of Yeshua. We build a Mishkan, but not a house for God because we can't go public yet because people hate us. You can't build a house for God during while we're conquering the seven nations of Canaan. That's a startup stage. They have to be punished for what they did wrong but we're not ready to make a name for God at that stage of our history. In the time of the Shoftim, we're following idol worship. All the nations hate us. There's not one positive relationship in the time of the Shoftim with another nation. And therefore, there's no time to build a house for God. We can have a Mishkan to remember our personal connection to God, a place to pray, but to go public with the idea of God, what Avram did, to make a name for God, that can't happen yet. It only happens in the time of David when David wants to build a house for God. And God tells David, not you, but your son, because you're still a man of war. There were too many wars you fought. And even though it's a great idea, things aren't ripe yet. He's going to tell. Actually, we'll take a quick look at it. We're going to stop this year. We're going to go to deeper Amin. Um, if you have a talk, you can open up. In deeper Amin, um, where are we? Oh, Chronicles is here in the beginning. In, in deeper Amin Aleph, chapter 22. Um, when David, after God appears to him and he answers his prayer, uh, the threshing floor of Arab and the Jebusite, which becomes Harabite, David decides, Zehu Beit Hashem Elohim. That's a place for God. His guy's name is Elohim. And this will be the Mizbeach for the Olah. And David gets all the uh, foreign workers together to do the stonework. Not Beit Elohim. Not Beit Hashem, a house for Elohim. We'll see, he wants to fulfill Yaakov's nether. He has all the building materials ready. Okay. Then he tells his son, David tells his son, Shlomo, I really wanted to build a house for God, to make his name great. That's the theme of Shem Hashem, the Krobe Shem Hashem, like Avram did. And David got it all ready before he died. And he calls Shlomo and tells him, listen, I really wanted to build this house for God, but God told me not you because you're a man of war. Not the wars that had to be, no, great wars, wars that had to be fought. You can't build a house for my name because you're living in a time of war. We have to wait for a time of peace. Remember in Kohelet, you know, Eid Nochama and Eid Shalom. But listen, you'll have a son. He has to be a man of peace, of rest. It means no more, no more wars. No more wars in the time of Shlomo. His name will be Shlomo, not because that's a technical thing, but his whole life will be Shalom. Shlomo from Lashon of Shalom. The Shalom Vesheket, it ain't how Yisrael Yamal. He'll have a time period of peace and quiet. No need for, uh, the time period of war is over. It's time for peace. He can build a house for my name. I'll be like a son, he'll be like a father, but 
I'm up to punish him if he goes bad. And then, um, so what does David do? That's the charge he gives to Shlomo to build a house. He gets everything ready for the next several chapters in Dibar Amim. He gets all the Konim and Levim already. And then in chapter 28, David gets the whole nation together and um, brings everyone together to Yerushalayim. He gives a whole big speech <coughs> where Elohim told him, you can't build a house because you were a man of war, but you're going to have a son. His name will be Shlomo and he'll build a house for God. Now listen carefully. I'm just doing this. You understand something every day in Davening. In Perak Chaptet, in chapter 29, David, the king, tells the whole nation gathered together before his death. He's still like, he's not dying yet, but he's close to his death. He charges Shlomo in public. Shlomo b'ni nar echad b'char Elohim. God shows you, Shlomo. You're young and still um, not ready yet. But m'lachad dola, there's a lot of work to do. Ki lola adam abira. Abira here means the Beit HaMikdash. It's not man shop to build this house for God because this house, this bira, this citadel for God is for Hashem Elohim. They says, he gives him a list. I get all these things ready. The gold, the silver, all the building materials. And then listen carefully. Um, he gives a list of all the people doing all the work for Beit HaDohim. Then everyone's happy. They all gathered together. Everyone donated lots of building materials and funding. David gives his whole speech. As he presents all the building material for the temple, the Shlomo, so that as soon as Shlomo's king, as soon as David dies and Shlomo becomes king, everything's ready to build the temple. And David's concluding words to the nation as he presents everything to build the temple, what does he say? By Varech David at Hashem We say this every morning in the evening, and we'll see why. Bimer David, Hashem Yisrael Avinu Why is God's name here? What happened to Yaakov, Avram, and Yitzchak? When Yaakov Davids, remember he says, Hashem Elohi, Avraham, Hashem Elohi, Yitzchak. Why all of a sudden is David saying, is referring to God as the God of Elohi Yisrael Avinu? What happened to Avram and Yitzchak? And why me olam v'yad olam? Remember we the word olam and brit olam by brit milah? Then he gives all praise. You get all, the, you get all the credit. It's not my house, it's your house. You get the credit. Okay, l'cha shamam l'cha. You're the king, not me. The whole the whole accent here is then everything's you. And then et cetera, in who am I to build this thing? Everything belongs to you. He goes, gives this whole big speech. All I want to point out is that David fulfills Yaakov's nether to build a house for God. I'm just trying to explain to you. Yaakov really wanted to build a house for God. That's his resolution. Because he's hoping he can. He has this universal idea, I can make a name for God, like Avram Avinu did, uh, at that same place where, where he had his dream. Remember, Yaakov, remember Avram and Betel built him his back and called out in God's name. And Yaakov is hoping when he comes back from exile, he'll be able to do that. And that was his great hope, and that was his resolution. His life, unfortunately, was so sad and so uh, depressing, and with so much um, travesty, etc., that didn't happen. And it never, Yaakov's goal to build a house for God that go universal, that other nations can look up to, to, to the Jewish people. And we can be his model nation. Doesn't happen until the time of Shlomo, which is Shlomo's prayer when, it's in Sefer Melachim and Perakhet, when he gives his whole big prayer when the temple is finally dedicated. Now I'm trying to explain to you that the reason why David says here, Burchat Hashem Elohi Yisrael Avinu, he's recognizing Hashem, the God of Yisrael Avinu. Why Yisrael? It means Yaakov here. Avinu, he's referring to Yaakov, not just Avam Yisrael, but not the God of Israel, but the God of Yaakov, Avinu, whose name is Yisrael, because the name change from Yaakov to Yisrael becomes official in Betel, as we just saw in Perak Lamed in, in Breshit. Now, one other custom we have, for those who come to the Shul in the old days, at least, is that in Pesuket de Zimra, right before Vavarek Dabi, the Gavai goes around with the Pushka and collects money. Anyone familiar with that minhag? Okay. You now, where it comes from, it comes from this. This is the source. Because when, right before Vavarech David, we have everyone being happy that they all donated money to the house house. And the money you collect for Vavarech David is for the shul. It's for the building fund of the shul. You know, there's the, the money for stucco for people who need money. They go around, you know, those collectors come after davening or whenever they come. But the money that should be collected, it's collected by Vavarech David, should be money for the for building the, uh, for taking care of the shul, which is a mikdash ma'ad. 
So there's a famous minag we have because of the juxtaposition of these two psukim. I just want, I want to spend time on that today because people daven every day and they say, Vavarech David, most people have no idea what the context is of Vavarech David. But because the ideal place of prayer is the Beit HaMikdash, remember, we're not supposed to pray in graveyards, we're supposed to pray in the Beit HaMikdash in, in Yerushalayim. And what David wants to build is this idea of making a name for God and going public with this idea of God. And our hope is that when we leave shul, we can act in a way that sanctifies God, which is the goal of the Beit HaMikdash. So David's benediction that we quote has a lot to do with fulfilling the goal of what Yaakov Avinu wanted to do, to make God's name great, and fulfill, remember, that parallel between Brit Mila and Brit Keshet, where God can't bring another flood. He wants man to be good. The whole flood story is how man was corrupt, and God gets angry when man's corrupt, but God's going to pick a nation. There'll be the model that fights corruption and learns from its mistakes and acts in a way that sanctifies God. So I just want to add that into... Uh, this whole idea of Yaakov and the number seven. Now, when I say the number seven, I mean God's name Elohim, which relates to number seven, and the idea of making a name for God in the positive, in the universal sense. I want to read one more example of the number seven in Breshit a little bit earlier in God's name Elohim. If you remember, actually, I'll just keep this one open. Go back to Sefer Breshit, um, Sefer Breshit, chapter 21. We read this on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, and not by chance. What happens here? This is right before the Akedah, but this is the highlight of Avram's career. What's Avimelech? And uh, his head of his army, which means he's the paradigm foreign power, who's a king with a, and has an army with him. And he's the main power that in the area that Avram is living in. What does he say? Hashem saying, Elohim is with you, everything you're going. But Avram becomes a model for other nations to learn from. And what Avram is fulfilling at this point in his life is the model for all what has to happen in his offspring, things go good. And therefore, Abimelech asked Avram, swear to me, please, in the name of Elohim, okay? That, you know, not to lie to me, and we want to have a, a treaty with one another. And maybe we want to get along. And Abimelech wants Avram to be his mentor. That's the idea of being an Avram ongoing that we talked about before. And Avram said, I'm going to swear, and follow that. And then Avram gives some muster about things that happened, Avimelech did wrong, Avimelech uh, apologizes, etc. How does Avram solidify this Brit? By Kach Avram Tzonu Bakar Beitein Avimelech, like Hutu Shem Brit. Save Avram at Sheva Kivsot Hatzon Levadhen. For some reason, Avram takes seven lambs. Why seven lambs? Don't be surprised if God's name here is Elohim, and there's a Brit. Where the goal of the Brit is to be an Avram on Goim. Remember, we had all that in Brit Milah? Don't be surprised that Avram, who knows Brit Milah and understands what it means to be an Avram on Goim and understands the theme of creation and the God of creation, don't be surprised they take specifically seven lambs. Okay? And, Ab- and Avimel asks, what's the meaning of these seven kvasot, of these seven lambs? Okay? And he says, take these seven lambs, um, that that'll be the sign or the, the witness about this well that we dug to remember it. And therefore, they call the place Beersheba. That's where they swear. And then with the wordplay, they make a Brit in Beersheba. And then Avi Melech leaves. What does Avram do in Beersheba? Avram goes back to his pastime of making a name for God, calling out in God's name. The same thing he did it back in Beitel, in Perik Yudbet and Gimel, in the beginning of Parshat Lech Lecha. So again, don't be surprised when God's name is Elohim. We go universal. We're making a name for God. And other nations look up to us. And that simply ties together the theme of the flood, and where God's upset with corruption before the flood. God should punish society whenever, civilization, whenever there's tons of corruption. God promises never to wipe everything out because there's hope of tshuva, there's hope of, of fixing things. To help, to help facilitate fixing things, God picks a nation, picks Avram to start a nation that'll be his model nation to act in a way that'll hopefully be a model for other nations to learn from, to be this Avram Goyim. Will it work again? That's our that's our goal. I'm just trying to show you this cult, this mega theme that we see all through in the theme of being a light to other nations. You can see it when you follow the, the theme of the number seven and the progression of covenant from Brit Mila, from Brit Keshe to Brit Mila to Brit Sinai, and the theme of Shem Elokim. Now you notice God's name Yud Kevavke is woven into all this because it's also Kriya B'Shem Hashem, because it's the same God, remember Hashem Elokim, but that'll be the God 
from the viewpoint of history without going to all the complexities of how Chumash um, weaves the two together. So that was the psukim I wanted to show you. Now let's get back to work with, we see this in the Mishkan now. Um, the next thing we have, again, something universal with other nations. We have the number seven again. I want to think of the chat here. Let's go back to our source sheet. Um, Pharaoh's dreams. For some reason, Pharaoh's dreaming seven years. There's, there's too many sevens, right? Remember, what's his first dream? Olot Sheva Porot, Yafot Mareh, B'nei Sheva Porot Remember, everyone knows the seven, the seven thin cows, the seven um, fat cows. And then the same thing, there's the seven sheaves of wheat, of, 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 uh, of wheat, Sheva Shibolim, and eating up the others. And that reflects seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. Again, that's nature, isn't it? Remember the idea of, of uh, the creation of seven days of nature. Don't be surprised that when we talk about nature, be it a famine or be it plenty, the number seven is going to be central. And that's one of the ways how I think Yosef realizes that and helps him solve the dream. So it's something I want to point out over and over again. Not just the idea of nature in the number seven, but God, the creator of nature. And God, as we saw in the Tochacha, remember, God uses nature as a tool to reward us when we're doing good and punish us when we're doing bad. That's what we saw last week at the end of this year. And that's why when we're punished, Sheva Chatotechem. Now, recognizing that nature is created by God and God can use, God creates nature and makes man, puts man in charge of nature. Remember, Reduba Fikif Shua. God gives man creativity and the ability, the ability to take civilization and progress with it, but he can do good things. He could, evil, could do good or could do evil. Man needs to remember that it's a blessing from God, the whole system of nature. He has to use his creativity for good and not for evil. If he uses it for evil, what will God do? God will use nature as a tool to punish him. And Chumash is screaming that. Remember what we say every day in Shema? If you follow my laws and build that just society, it'll rain at the right time and everything will prosper. If you don't, I'm going to use nature to punish you. There'll be droughts, there'll be famines, there'll be disease, there'll be trouble. And seven times more than the blessing, if, um, no, it's, if you do bad, God will get extra angry. And that's what the Tochacha is screaming, and therefore don't be surprised that number seven comes up in the Tochacha over and over again. Okay, now, so that was seven in Sefer Brashid. I hope I made my point clear. In Sefer Abba, we saw and thing. And again, it's all stories you know. I'm just trying to show you. I think there's a thing going on from creation. So that was the whole point I tried to clarify last week. We're going from creation to the story of the flood, which is a recreation story, and then solidified by Brit Akeshet, the Rainbow Covenant. Um, and then from the Rainbow Covenant, we go to Brit Mila, which takes us to Brit Sinai, and God picking a nation to be his model nation. Now we want to show you the number seven by the Mishkan. Now, there's a great machloket about the Mishkan, whether the Mishkan it's a reflection of creation or revelation. Ramban, Nachman Hadiz, proves beautifully that there's so many details of the Mishkan that reflect what happened at Harsinai. And the covenant that we make with God at Harsinai, where Moshe goes up to the mountain um, and receives the Luchot to Evan, the Luchot, and enters the Brit. And he, he goes there by himself, but on the mountain, Kohanim come up higher, and the people at the bottom of the mountain with an altar, with the Mizbech, you have the same thing happening in Har Sinai that you have happening in the Mishkan. In the Mishkan, there's an altar in the courtyard. There's an area, which is like the mountain, the Asara, where the Kohanim come in, and the Eichal. And then the Kodesh Kodeshim, where only the Kohen Gadol goes in. And in the, Kohen, in the Kodesh Kodeshim, there's the Aron with the Luchot that Moshe received in Har Sinai. He goes on and on the Ramban, but he proves beautifully that the Mishkan is a reflection of Mamad Har Sinai. And therefore, when we visit God in the Mishkan, we remember our commitment to be God's people at Har Sinai. In fact, one of the examples of the korbanot that we bring, whenever there's a, um, a korban musaf, it's always seven kvasim, which I think goes back to the story of Avram and the, and the lambs. Hopefully we'll get there soon. Now, in the Mishkan itself, the main kli, we'll see there's a menorah, the, korban, the menorah has seven uh, branches to it, which I think we'll see by that relate to the idea of creation and the whole idea of light, which has a lot to do with creation. But I want to show you a phenomenon at top, which is, I think is amazing. When I look in um, the story of the Mishkan, of course, the seven days of Miluim, when the Mishkan's finished, we have seven days of Miluim followed by the eighth day. We're going we're to 
that'll be next week's show. We're going to use the Midlum story to understand Hanukkah and what's called Zot Hanukkah. So that'll be next week's share. I want to end today's share with uh, just an observation, which I think can't be by chance. There's a unit called Sibuya um, Mishkan, where God commands the Mishkan. Wait, let me stop the share real quick. There's a unit in Chumash where God commands the Mishkan. At the end of Parshat Mishpatim, Moshe Rabbeinu goes up for 40 days and 40 nights. And then um, what happened next is a big argument. But there's one unit, what's called Parshat Truma in Tetzav and half of Kitisa, where God tells Moshe Rabbeinu the commandment to build the Mishkan. If this commandment was before the sin of the Golden Calf or after, that's a big argument. But in Chumash, it's one big unit. I want to look at the unit and notice how many times God speaks in that unit. Watch what happens. If you have a Tzach Korn at home, it's better to follow with that. But I'm going to use a, um, I'll use this one on, online. Move this up here. Here we have Sefer Shemot, chapter 25. Actually, look at the end of chapter 24. In the end of chapter 24, Moshe Ravina goes up for 40 days and 40 nights. Then Ravina Moshe Betoch Hanan, Moshe is the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And Moshe goes up to get the Luchot the Evan, the Torah and the Mitzvah. The narrative continues with the story of the golden calf. But now between chapter 24 and chapter 32, which is the golden calf, in these chapters, let me mark it here. These from here, I don't know how to mark them. Yeah. These chapters, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31, are all the Mishkan, the commandment to build the Mishkan. Now watch what happens. Look how chapter 25 begins. By Daber Hashem Moshe Lemor, Quotation mark. Right here, it needs to be a quotation mark, right? Daber B'nai Yisrael. If I follow carefully, God starts speaking to Moshe right here in Pasuk Aleph and Perech and God doesn't stop talking until, until the end of chapter 29, until the beginning almost of chapter 30, we'll see. Meaning, here's a Dibor, got it? And then there'll be a lot of commandments. Basu Aron, commandment. Basita Shochan, commandment. Basita Menorah, Remember the word Vasit is cool. Remember what does God say in the beginning? Um, mikdash, mikdash and therefore Vasu Aron, and then Vasita, Vasita, Vasita. In chapter 26, what do you have? God's still talking, the same Dibor. Bete Mishkan a little more passive. Vasita Takrashim, God's still talking, the same Dibor. Vasita Porochet, God's still talking. What's next? Chapter 27. Vasita et mizbeach at seishitim. Vasita et chazer mishkan. Okay, and vatat zaveh bnei Yisrael. God's still talking to Moshe Rabbeinu. Void. And what's he tell them? Do you have to bring shemen lamaor? And in chapter twenty, we're in twenty-eight now, right? Twenty-eight. We have the laws. Bring Aaron closer. Vasita bidei kodesh Aaron echicha. God's still talking. He started in Perek He's still talking. Vasuot eifod. Vasita mishpatot zahav, vasita chosh mishpat, all the big day kuna and perk chavchet, vasita melefod, vasita tzit zav tor. God's still talking, right? Chapter 29. God continues talking in chapter 29. Vizeh adavar sher ta'aselem, the karish dem nechayenbe, the seven days of Miluim. We'll talk about that next week in detail to understand Hanukkah. But there will be Hanukkah tamizbeach. We need this, this seven days of Miluim to understand Hanukkah. We'll see why next week. Here I'm supposed to God's still talking. The daily that's the Korban Tamid in the morning and evening. But God's still talking since Perak And in Perak Lamed, he's still talking. In Perak Lamed, Vasitim is Bach Miktak Torah. Why it's at the end? Topic in itself. But from the beginning of chapter 25 all the way till Pasuk Yud in chapter 30, God is one long Dibor. You with me? God starts talking again now in Pasuk Yud Aleph and Tarek Lamed. So we have one extremely long Dibor from chapter 25 till um, the middle of chapter 30. One Dibor about how to build the Mishkan. Then we have the second Dibor, which is counting the Machsit Shekel. Another Dibor, Vaydab Hashem Moshe to build the Kior. Another Vaydab Hashem Moshe Making the um, Shemina Mishra. Another Dibor, God telling Moshe Rabbeinu, to make the Torah, Pitamak Torah. 
And then in chapter 31, we have another Dibor by God, by Dabash Hashem Bor, to appoint B'Tzalda to build the Mishkan. And finally it ends with the last time God speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu, telling him to keep Shabbat, which will be the Od Brit. Everyone follow? And then starts the story of what call, of Chet Egel in chapter 32. So this whole unit again, from chapter 31 to 25, got it? What does it have? It has one massive Dibor, chapters 25 through 30. And then let's count up how many we have afterwards. Let's go back to chapter 30. Anyone keep track of how many we had? We had one big one and see how many small ones. Here's the first one. One Dibor, Machsita Shekel. Another Dibor, the Kior, it's two. A third small Dibor, Shemina Mishra. The fourth small Dibor, making the Ktoret. The fifth small Dibor, appointing Betzala. And the last small Dibor is Shabbat. How many is that all together? One big one. Six small ones all together? Seven. You with me? There's seven Dibors with the Mishkan. That can't be by chance. Now, why the big one, why the small one? That's way beyond today's share. And what's number seven? Guess what? The seventh Dibor in this unit is nothing other than Remember? Isn't that parallel creation? In my opinion, that's the best proof that the Mishkan is a reflection of creation, not just a revelation. It's both. But here, remember, it's right here. Remember all the covenantal language? Remember the word Asa I pointed out every single one begins with Asiya? When we come to the Mishkan, we have to remember that God made nature. And God gave us Selim and Lokim, and God made us creative. We stop creativity, remember, once a week on Shabbat. But we need to remember why we're chosen. And the theme of Brit Milah, of Italech Lefanevi Tamim. And we have to be in Avamon Goyim. And therefore, the, um, I'm saying the number seven, that's all we wanted to get across. Number seven in the Mishkan is key. We'd have to show you why the menorah is seven, and why the menorah is the main Avodah in the Mishkan. That's not, we can't do that this week. We'll do it. That'll take us to Hanukkah. I have to give you a share to explain why the menorah is seven and why of all the kelim of the Mishkan, by far the menorah is the most important. That's not fair because I'm a Kohen, so I'm sort of biased, but I'll try to explain that in the next two shiurim. that will help us explain Hanukkah. Uh, we'll have to see that Hanukkah Tamizbech as well. But that'll be our, our goal for, for next week. But today what I want to show you was Yaakov builds that nether. Yaakov, who's Shem you know, we finished the process of Brit Milah, whose main focus is God's name Elohim. And he wants to build a house for God. And he wants to build a bite. That's his resolution, which isn't fulfilled in the time of David who builds it. But the whole idea of a house for God, which begins in its earliest stage with the Mishkan, when it's presented, it's in seven divorce. Remember? And what did God do in six days of creation? Remember? Remember? God said do, and it happened. And now, instead of God saying things and happening, God commands us and we do it. Because now we become partners with God in creation. Okay, we can go on. That's the rest is a rabbi speech. I just think that I'm um, looking again, the meaning of the number seven. Again, it could be just totally coincidental. I don't think it is that we have all this divorce. Is that why, why? Again, you can ask why the small, what's in the small ones? That's the share in itself. Maybe we'll have time to do it next week. There's, why specifically these topics are the leftovers at the end? But the fact that in this one big unit of building the Mishkan, there's seven divorce. The last one is Shabbat. And the sixth one is appointing in Pizzalo to build it, which is man. That's parallel to making man. The others don't, the others match up a little bit, not as good as those two. But the sixth one being man building the Mishkan, Pizzalo being appointed uh, with Ruach, remember? Um, it's, like, it's like, it works beautiful. And then the seventh one is Shabbat. Okay, so I know my time is up. I have to fit the, to the chat. That's why I want to, I hope you understand the title now, the number seven in God's name in relation to Yaakov and relating to the Mikdash. Maybe it's a bit stretching it, but it's worth a share, worth a try. So let me look at the chat. I didn't look at her all today. Let's take a look. Okay. Um, okay, Jay Kelman, one second. I read, okay, we talked about last seven years. Okay. Oh, there's the source sheets. They're good. 
Is there a difference between enforcement and flexibility? So when one makes a covenant with God? Ah, okay. The the whole theme, that's the sheer in Parsha Ba'era. <laughs> we get that far. But in Parsha Ba'era, we God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, remember, um, I appeared to the Avot with God's name El Shaddai. That was on last week's. Um, I'm going to get to this in a minute. I'll go back to Ipad's question at the end because if people have to leave, that's a longer answer. I need last, last week's source sheet. I'll bring it up. Okay, the film is called an Oat. Call from Dina. Okay. Uh, um, do a quick mute there. You got it, Call Rabbi? From... Okay. Um, the film is also called an Oat. Is goat in any way connected to Bre the rainbow and Breach Shabbat? That's a good question. Um, Tefillin for sure relates to um, Breach Sinai, doesn't it? It's Tefillin for sure it relates to the Mitzvot. But remember, we have it in, in both parts of Kriyat Shema. Remember, um, and in Kriyat Shema, we have the idea of nature that's going to reward us if we keep the mitzvot, and nature punishes us if we don't keep the mitzvot, which is um, ex you know, explained in much more detail in the Tochacha. But in the shortest version we have in the second parasha of Kriyat Shema, which also includes Tefillin, so that could be one of the reminders. Um, there's a uh, Chaza, I mean, in Halakha, we, we don't wear tefillin on Shabbat because Shabbat is an oath and we don't need tefillin for that reason, if I'm not mistaken. For sure, for sure it's related, but um, I think in relating to God using nature as a punishment and as a reward, I think there, there's two sides, Mashiach, Ben David, ah, we'll, I'll go back to that later on. Um, local custom, also language for most of the generation when Torah is given. Ah, that's a question. Does the seven-day week exist before, before the story of the month? That we have to talk about. Um, how do you relate to the role of Jewish people as to do tshuva? I think that we don't have to be a perfect nation. We have to, we have to be a nation that learns from its mistakes. Because God doesn't want us to be perfect. He, he wants he wants to be perfect. He wants us to learn from our mistakes. That's why you say, I wrote bit tshuva. So it's not that you have to be God's model nation, but you can be a model nation by learning from your mistakes as well. It's not just being perfect, but learning from mistakes. And that's how you grow. You don't make mistakes on purpose, but... But if, if we make mistakes, that doesn't mean you can't fulfill your goal as God's people. It means you have to be a model by learning from your mistakes, recognizing them, and, and growing from them. Um, Jake comes back after 20 years. No, he comes back. There's seven years of Rachel, seven years of Leah. I mean, seven years of Leah, seven years of Rachel, and then six years he works. That's the 20 years. And then there's another year in between until he gets back home. That's a little complicated when you study, um, when he goes to Sukkot, what happens then? That's a Sharon Parsha Vayishlach. Okay, I've seen the pushkut going around there, Chazat Yeah, that's true, but the, um, that's because most more people were in show by then. <laughs> but the, the classic custom is, right, Rabbi Jay? Is Vavarach David as they go around with the pushka? Yeah, that's the custom. Okay. It's more um, convenient okay. for people in Chazar and Hashat. doesn't interfere, but yeah, the, the Minag is right. And it's also before you daven, there's that second idea. And davening, of course, is Shmon Esra, so you want to give Staka kind of before the Amida. I hope you help me. What parak of Hosuk was that in the Vayvorach David? Nine, chapter 29 in Divarayamim Aleph. Thank you. I just wanted to, I wanted to share that because it comes up a lot with, uh, now, um, iPad asked a question about, about um, the different Britot, between, a difference between a Brit B'Shem Elohim and B'Shem Havaya. We're touching a really complicated topic. I just want to bring, I want to share with you Last week's source sheet, which we didn't do in detail, I just noted it. Let me open up a. Just give me one second. Class number five. Here we go, and I'll share my screen. Now I get my screen. Here we go, and share screen. And it should be on last week's source sheet. To do this right would take another five hours, but remember, it was all nice and drawn up last week. There. Remember this one? In the beginning of right before the plagues begin, Elohim comes to motion, tells them, Aniyot Kevavke. You see over the two, two names are coming together? Okay. And then God tells Elohim, tells Moshe verse, my name is Yud Kevavke. I appeared to the forefathers, the El Shaddai, that we explained that today. But my name, I didn't make myself known with the name Yud Kevavke until now. Members, Vyadu Mitzam Kiani Hashem, means God didn't change nature. There's a beautiful Ramban. In chapter 17 in Breshit, and here as well, 
which says God's name El Shaddai is what's called Nis Nistar, and God's name Yud Kevavke is Nis Nikla, meaning um, with our forefathers, God works within the framework of nature. One time in history, coming out of Egypt, God you know, turns basically nature around and changes nature and does all these massive miracles to take us out of Egypt, to make his name known that God's presence is felt. The goal is to, to have the feeling of Yud Kevavke in a world of Elohim. Remember Hashem Elohim? Is to live with nature and treat it like a miracle. That, 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 that's a much higher level than watching miracles. But I need training with a miraculous training experience to clarify once and for all that there's a God who's in charge of nature, who made nature, who can control nature, and therefore he has to do miracles to change nature so that later on when you live with nature, you treat nature like it's a miracle that, that we talked about a little bit with the story of the month. So now, with the two Britot that I've had asked, this is Brit Mila. That's clearly Brit Mila. It's all the phrases. And the second one, that's Inoi Vabdu Vinotam, that's Brit Ben of Tarim. And therefore, coming out of Egypt, both Britot come together. Now, if you're learning Sefer Shemot, that gets a little complicated because when Amisro cries out for redemption from suffering, God can save them in one of two ways. God can have sorrow on them, rahmanas on them, mercy on them, and just give them a lighter workload. I don't need to leave Egypt to solve their suffering in Egypt. I can have a lighter, I can have a lighter workload. Amisro isn't crying in Egypt, oh, we want to be in the land of Israel, we want to be, we're, it's not a Zionistic cry, we want to be in our homeland. They're crying from the Avodah Kasha. That's clear. And God could save them simply in the framework of Brit Milam. I'm your God. I'll take care of you. I'll give, I'll give Pharaoh a heart attack and a new Pharaoh will come in and he'll be nicer or something like that. Or I, God could solve the problem without ma major miracles. God can also solve the problem in a redemption process where he takes us out of Egypt and brings us to the land of Israel, which will be a roller coaster. That's what's going to happen in Yisrael Mitzrayim. Am Yisrael is praying for a, just a lighter workload and God's going to take him way more than what they prayed for. But that's the topic in Sefer Shemot. And therefore, Tel B'nai Yisrael, Mebra Hashem, that's the three, first three cups is Brit Ben of Tarim. And the fourth cup is Brit Sinai. That's Brit Mila. And then you'll know that I'm the same God who took you out of Egypt. It's the same God who gave it the Torah Har Sinai. And then we get the land. Remember, both Brit told God promises the land. And the land that God promised to be a land we post to God in Brit Mila is also the land that we're going to inherit and conquer in the framework of Brit Ben Tarim. And then remember, it's Ani Hashem and Ani Hashem. Again, it's really complicated, but whatever iPad was asking, that's the beginning of the answer about um, how both Britot work with God. And both Britot, you can, you know, you can, in both Britot, the eternal Britot, the Brit Olam, but God can, if we don't keep our side, um, God, God can't break the Brit, but he can get really angry within the framework of the Brit. So we're always his people, but we can suffer a lot if we don't do a good job. Okay, anyway, we're way over time again. No way. Just a little bit over time. Just a few minutes. Just a few minutes. That's, that's okay. With questions, that's fine. It's, I mean, we don't go too crazy, but yeah, 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 yeah. It's only 12 19, 7 19 in Israel. Okay, thank you very much. We look forward to next week. And so uh, we look forward to the same. There's two weeks till Hanukkah, right? Right, right. Next week is not Hanukkah. Hanukkah first night is two weeks tonight. So it's not, okay. it'll be Hanukkah for you in two weeks, but not for those of us in North America. That's so right. uh, <laughs> that, but since you're based in Israel, Kimitzi and Teitze Torah, it'll be Hanukkah in two weeks. Two weeks today will be Hanukkah. So, next, uh, but next week not. Next week not. Yeah. Next yeah, week yeah. I'll actually be I'll be broadcasting from Tinek Erekodesh. Oh, Tinek. Okay, back to the states. Okay, very good. We're going to be for for Shabbos with Shul. In uh, in the five in youngest of Cedar of Lawrence Cedar. Are oh, you going to be in the five towns for Shabbos and then for Sunday in Tinek? Okay, okay very Sunday. nice. Okay. Very good. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody during the week to next year, tomorrow, 11 a.m. Rabbi Dr. Lindsay Guhertz continues her series on translations in the Bible. Tomorrow night, um, Mark Shapiro on Shaul Lieberman. And of course, I mentioned Tuesday we'll have um, 
um, after Rachel, Rachel Sharansky's class, Rachel Danziger Sharansky, um, and that'll be at 11, and then at 1 o'clock, Rabbi Adler will give uh, the beginning of the three-part series on Hanukkah. So we look forward to, to learning with you, everybody. Well, and invite a friend. That's uh, like I always say all the time, but uh, you know what they say in marketing, you got to say over and over again, uh, please invite your friends, and uh, one friend, uh, start there, and uh, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Okay, and your suggestions, as I said in the beginning, are always welcome and encouraged. Um, okay. Uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. Shavuot Tov. We look forward to learning with you soon. Bye-bye.